Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I guess you all can see that I'm not Nina Jensen. <laughs> no surprise. Unfortunately, Nina called us quite desperately this morning, having a personal crisis on her own. She was very, very sorry that she could not attend the conference. Uh, so I'm jumping and trying to be Nina instead. Uh, Trondheim Techport will invite Nina back to Trondheim, and I'll promise you that uh, all of the conference attendees will get an invitation when she's back in Trondheim. She was supposed to be here from uh, Rev Ocean, where she is the CEO, and Rev Ocean's uh, goal is to create one healthy oceans, because we got a lot of challenges to tackle when it comes to ocean, and technology might be one of the solutions. So, in this session, we hope to explore what's next for innovation within ocean technology and to understand how important the ocean is for Norway's economy. Joining me first here on stage, I'm so happy to introduce Nikolai Astrup. He is a member of the Norwegian Parliament, who is currently sitting in the uh, Energy and Environment Standing Committee. So please give a warm welcome to Nikolai. Thank you, Nina. No, Karana. So we're talking about the oceans. So you need to put away your cell phones and focus on this big topic. Not me, because I'm not that interesting, but after me, you will have some really interesting speeches. So I hope you pay attention. It's great to be here at uh, Trondheim Techport, an arena that brings people together to share ideas and innovative solutions on some of the most pressing global issues of our time. The ocean is at the heart of so many of our global challenges. It's also at the heart of so many great opportunities. So let's start with some facts. Eight million tons of plastic ends up in the oceans every year. By 2050, there may be more plastic in the oceans than fish. All this plastic is slowly contaminating wildlife, birds, seafood, and marine ecosystems. Add to this that illegal, unregulated, and unreported fishing threatens fish stocks and marine wildlife across the world and causes countries to lose out on billions of dollars every year. The conclusion becomes clear. The time to act is now. The landmark decision earlier this month, where delegates from 175 countries agreed to start work on a comprehensive international treaty in the full life cycle of plastics, was a good beginning. The World Bank Fund ProBlue set up a couple of years ago to provide financial mechanisms to support waste management systems and sustainable fisheries in developing countries needs to be scaled up and put to good use. Likewise, employing the ingenuity, innovation and capital of leading ocean companies through the UN Global Compact on Sustainable Ocean Business will be vital. And the UN High Level Panel for a Sustainable Ocean Economy established by former Prime Minister Arna Solberg, has provided a solid understanding of the opportunities and challenges we face in the years to come. Norway has supported all of these measures, and many more. We have lived by the sea and of the sea for centuries. We know that clean seas are rich seas. We also know that sustainable ocean management transcends borders. If we manage to strike the right balance between production and protection, we can harvest huge resources from the sea, and we will need to. By 2050, we may well be 10 billion people on this planet. Demand for food will increase. Agriculture, already under threat, will be even more ravaged by climate change. Today, only 2% of the world's protein comes from the oceans. In the future, it must be much more. Norway has great ambitions as an ocean nation. Our aim is to increase fish farming substantially and sustainably in the coming years. For that to happen, we need innovation in all parts of the value chain. And after me, you'll hear from Optoscale, which is one of the companies providing solutions to this uh, challenge. We also want to make better use of ocean resources like seaweed and kelp and increase our harvest from conventional fishing through prudent management of our fish stocks. And the next chapter in the saga of the Norwegian continental shelf will be about harvesting the best wind resources in Europe, transforming natural gas into emission-free blue hydrogen, 
and storing CO2 underneath the seabed. Sustainability will and must be essential for all our future endeavors. To mention just one example, new offshore wind farms in the North Sea will be important for Norway's future energy supplies and contribute to the European energy transition. But they can only be realized if they can coexist with our fisheries, with our memory and wildlife, and with healthy ecosystems. In order to reap the full benefits of our oceans, we need to keep investing in research and development and infrastructure to test new innovations, like a new ocean space center here in Trondheim. And a new campus, I may add. I hear there's a bit of, uh, what shall I say, news regarding the new campus. We need to stick to the original plan, because these facilities are so important for the interdisciplinary approach that we need to reach sustainable development goals by 2030. And 2030, in this sense, is basically tomorrow. Data sharing and data processing will also gain importance as new tools like AI, IoT and 5G will make it possible to go about our business in completely new ways, creating new opportunities, overcoming old challenges. And while companies in China and the US have a head start on consumer-related applications and platforms, I believe Norway and the Nordics have a competitive edge within industrial and ocean-related technologies and applications. Collecting and sharing more ocean-related data from companies, researchers, and governmental agencies will be more important going forward. Too often, companies believe that their own data is too valuable to be shared. But more often than not, the real value of data is unlocked when shared and coupled with other data sets. And as you know, AI feeds on data. And if we need AI to really create new value and new solutions, then we also need the data to do it. I also believe that procurement policies and government directives can be a powerful tool to foster innovation in this space. And the public sector spends 600 billion Norwegian crowns every year on goods and services. And how we spend that money will have a huge impact on how innovative, how sustainable we become. And that includes in this ocean space. In closing, Norway is already a leading ocean nation. And our experience, technology, and competence in ocean-related operations is an excellent starting point for our future ocean ventures. To unlock these opportunities, we need to work together in the spirit of sustainable development goal number 17. And keep in mind that the future favors those who dare to stay ahead. So let's make sure that's us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nikolai, for joining us here today. The next speaker guest on the stage and this session is Kristin Pettersen, who is a professor of engineering cybernetics at NTNU. Her main research interests are the development of methodologists for the analysis and control of autonomous robots. She has consistently endeavored to create a new class of futuristic marine robots that are inspired by nature. And if anyone of you have seen the Norwegian movie Nusjön and the snake robot in that film, ladies and gentlemen, here are the women behind. Kristin, welcome. Thank you, and thank you so much for the invitation to come here to take part. I will talk about our research on snake robots and how it has evolved from nature through research at university and into industry, and creating a new class of marine robots. My area of expertise is autonomous robots, and the motivation for our research on biological snakes and snake robots comes from the mobility that we find in biological snakes. Mobility is, of course, an important feature for autonomous robots, and snakes, they can move in virtually any terrain, including rough terrain, where, for instance, legged or wheeled robots could run into problems. We here see how a biological snake moves in quite cluttered terrain, and instead of avoiding obstacles, it uses the obstacles, pushing against them to move even faster forward. Snakes are also very good climbers, and also here we see that the snake uses the irregularities to push forward. Snakes are also excellent swimmers, and due to their slender and flexible body, they can access narrow openings. 
And some snakes, they can even fly. They climb onto branches and throw themselves off, gliding through the air by curling their motion. So flying, or rather doing a controlled falling. Snake robots are built to have the features of biological snakes to achieve these same mobility properties. And we here see one of our snake robots named Mamba swimming around in the laboratory at T-Holt. It performs these simple undulations, just like the sea snake, and we see how efficiently it then moves through the water. So Mamba is a demonstrator, a proof of concept, showing that swimming snake robots are indeed capable of exploring the oceans. But to fully understand snake robots, we do what we always do when we want to understand a physical system in depth. We build a mathematical model of it. And when we develop such a mathematical model, we use pencil and paper, and we write page after page after page until we finally understand how snakes behave. And some people ask, why do you need a mathematical model when you have a physical snake robot like Mamba? And that is because Mamba is one particular snake robot, and everything we can observe from Mamba the only thing we know is that this holds for sure for the member robot. While this mathematical model here, it describes all the snake robots in the world, regardless of whether they are short or long, heavy or light, whether they are moving on land or are swimming in the oceans. So mathematics is a language that we use to understand snake robots. And by analyzing this mathematical model, we can find inherent properties of snake robots and of biological snakes. And in this way, we use mathematics to decode the secrets of nature. Take, for instance, the snake robot Anaconda. It moves using the same undulations as biological snakes use, but as you can see, it's not able to move forward. It's just lying there. And using our mathematical model, we could analyze this problem and establish that the reason for this is its smooth surface. In order for undulations to make the robot move forward, it needs to have a certain friction property, namely anisotropic friction, meaning that the friction in the sideways direction needs to be larger than the friction in the long ways direction. And biological snakes, they have this friction property due to their scaled skin. And in water, the hydrodynamic drag forces, they provide this property also without needing these kind of scales because of the long and slender body of the snake. So not only can we learn from nature in order to achieve mobility for our robots, but the robotics research can actually also help us understand nature. So learning from nature, we found a robot which moves efficiently through water with a slender and flexible body, which makes it easy to access narrow spaces, like, for instance, between rocks, inside shipwrecks, or under ice. But snakes cannot stand still in water. They cannot hover. If it stops undulating, the ocean currents will make it drift away. And that led to our next research question, which was, why not combine the best of nature and biology with the best from technology, combining the slender and flexible, flexible body of snakes with thrusters, giving the robot the ability to hover, for instance, to inspect something or to pick something up. And here we see the resulting robot. These results here have been reported in books and research papers, that is, in publications, which constitute one important outcome of the university. To help other researchers solve their research problems and find answers to their research questions, and thus pushing the research front forward. The research has also included the education of a high number of master and PhD students. And our students, they constitute the most important innovation impact of the university, as these highly skilled, intelligent young professionals go into industry and public sector, applying their new research-based knowledge and thus creating innovation. 
but sometimes also the research directly leads to an innovation that we want to bring out of the laboratories and into practical use. And we realized that this new swimming snake robot had features that made it a solution to problems faced by marine biologists, marine archaeology, and in particular, the offshore energy sector. Specifically, this new marine robot, it combines several features of existing marine robots into one tool. It has good hydrodynamic properties, it can go straight as a torpedo and turn by curving its body and is thus well suited for long range operations like survey AUVs. It has better access capabilities than even the smallest observation ROVs as its slender and flexible body makes it able to go through narrow openings and it can perform light intervention operations like turning a valve or picking up something since the robot in itself is a manipulator arm. And to bring this robot out of the laboratories and into practical use, the company Illum was established in 2015. The support from the new TTO was crucial in the startup of Illum. We met this great team here that supported us through all the different steps of the startup. And the new TTO has gathered very high expertise and they were instrumental and very hands on in the process, not only giving advice, but actively participating through the different steps, including market analysis and business development. And they were guiding us very gently, but firmly towards a focus on customer needs. And that was required because university research is focused on moving the research front forward, advancing the scientific field, while for a company, the focus has to be on customer needs. Moreover, we got much needed soft funding, first from NTNU Discovery and then from the Norwegian Research Council through FONI. And this funding was also essential in enabling us to verify the technology. And then, in order to accelerate the process and reduce time to market, Illum entered into a strategic partnership with two much larger actors, Kongsberg Maritime and Equinor. Kongsberg Maritime has unique experience in marine robotics, building on the market-leading AUV Hugin. And they immediately saw the potential of this new marine robot. Also, Equinor, with its massive experience from offshore energy, was very forward-leaning and agile and immediately saw the potential and supported it. So, the Illum company has three important partners, Equinor, Kongsberg and NTNU. And also, funding from the Norwegian Research Council and from Innovation Norway has been crucial. This video here shows the Illum concept with the very first Illum robot, which was tethered. Now we are on generation three of the Illum robot, which is untethered and with higher autonomy capabilities. And we see how it can snake its way through and around obstacles and in through narrow openings. Little did we know that Illum would also make it into the movie industry, uh, becoming an action movie star in the movie No Share This Fall. So it has been quite a journey from nature through university and into industry. And the Illum robot will be a useful tool for exploring the oceans and for the offshore energy sector in the times to come. And it all started with the curiosity-driven research asking the question of how can we learn from nature to achieve high mobility for our autonomous robots. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kristin. That was really exciting to hear the story about. I'm now very thrilled to welcome to the stage Arianna Minoretti, the Chief Engineer in the Technology and Development Department of Statens Vevasen. She is here today to present some of the most innovative projects that Statens Vevasen is currently working on. So Arianna, please welcome to the stage. Thank you, Karianne, and good afternoon, everyone. I would like to start with a question. 
In the race to the new technologies, would you place your bet on the public administration? Most people don't. Public administration in the collective imagination is a sort of big, heavy turtle, very different from the agile hairs that dominate the market. But it is this diversity that makes us successful in the competition on new technologies. And I would like to explain to you why. Finding new solutions and applying these solutions into practice are two very different things. Because the application of a new technology requires a standardization process that establishes, for example, that the risk associated with this technology is below an acceptable level. So if you're a private company working in a new technology field, at a certain point you have to come and knock on our door to ask for the approval to use this technology into practice. And I have already heard many companies complaining about the fact that the rules and regulations are not revised fast enough to bring the new technology into the market. So how would it be if you just start to consider the big heavy turtle earlier in the process? Many would be surprised to know that we have a continuous development work with new technology to reach our goals sooner and better, aiming for a better transport system, also in terms of climate, environment, digitalization, safety, and cost optimization. But I can make an example. I'm sure many have heard about a coastal highway road E49 in Norway to cross some of the deepest and widest fjords along, uh, along the west coast in uh, Norway. We are working on new solutions like floating bridges, suspension bridges on tension leg platforms, and the submerged floating tube bridge. This is a submerged tube bridge floating at a defined depth underwater level. This emergence allows us to create a hidden crossing, but also to reduce the main sea load that the structure has to withstand. And it is also thanks to the feasibility studies done by the Norwegian Public Road Administration in the last years, together with the help of consultants and universities, that the first international regulation on this structure has been published by the International Association for Structural Concrete, the FIB. And, of course, we are working on these technological solutions because we are engineers and what bothers us is just to build bridges. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but, for example, think about the Bjornafjord, south of Bergen. We are working on a more than five kilometer long floating bridge to replace today's ferry. The bridge will reduce the crossing time from 45 minutes to more or less five minutes. So this means the possibility to reach schools and workplaces every day. Or think about the Rogfast, the subsea tunnel. The, 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 the tunnel will reduce the crossing time, uh, the, the time between Stavanger and Bergen by two hours. So that's a huge difference. A bridge brings possibilities. But we are aware of, of the possible impact of such a type of structure, for example, on environment or climate. So that's why we have done a study on the CO2 production connected with the whole life cycle of the bridge, and we have compared it to the CO2 production by the, done by the ferries. And would you be surprised to know that the bridge scenario can be more climate friendly than the ferries? as maybe you would be surprised to know that a movement of such a type of structure in water can create noise for some species. So that's why we have to evaluate the environment from the first design stages and also to define rules and regulation taking care in, uh, of the environment. So that's why we have done a study with the NINA Research Center here in Trondheim to evaluate the environment, the biological uh, impact of this type of structure. And uh, also to take care of the environment in our uh, best practices or rules and regulation. Because, you know, define rules and regulation, this is part of our work. Uh, to give tools to the designers and the construction companies. Like, for example, the tool we have created and shared on our website on the CO2 calculation for the whole life cycle of a structure. Everyone can use it to understand the CO2 connected with every choice done in the design. Like, for example, changing materials. And it is also materials that we are working together uh, with several partners to evaluate new possibilities. Like, for example, with Antanu, the university here in Trona, we are testing new possibilities for local greener concrete. 
also to provide a durable uh, and robust solution for our infrastructure. And it is still with Antenu, in addition to, to Elkem and other partners, that we are working in the SFE FISMET research project to find new applications for aluminium that could maybe be a solution for some of our bridges. Because, uh, you know, our bridges like the Bjorn, Fjord, or other areas along the E39, you don't have to think about them like just a local project. They are a sort of laboratory developing innovative solutions that could be used widely in Norway. And maybe not only Norway. Like, for example, we have this bulk. It's the Bjornafjord Open Life Center. This is a digital tool to reduce the risk associated with the construction of the Bjorn of your crossing. But bulk could be also an instrument to be used during the life cycle of the structure. And it could be used also for other infrastructures, like the structure we are studying and developing with the Sintef and the other research partner in the SFE Blues research project. Solutions for transport, energy production, housing, food production. We discuss, we develop solutions, we test them, and we apply them in real practice. So this is the procedure that we are using in several research projects we are involved in, like the one we are developing with Antenu and the research center Casa here in Trone. Uh, here we are developing new methods to evaluate explosion loads, for example, and we are validating our prediction with the help of the Defense State Agency that is performing several tests. So, with our partner, we develop greener, safer, more competitive solution. We test them, we work on the related rules and regulation if necessary, and we bring the new solution into practice. And I have to add, we enjoy what we are doing. So in the race for the new technology, we probably are one of the best partners. But let's go back to the beginning. <laughs> in the race to the new technology, would you place your bet on the public administration? Would you bet on the big heavy turtle? Because it's true, we are big and heavy. But just because we are a solid institution, we take care of the responsibility we have towards the society, and we work every day to provide the best solution the market can give in a safe way to the population. But, you know, in this road of a more challenging future with greener goal to be reached as soon as possible, we are all working on the same boat, so collaboration is a key element for our future. But looking toward the future, I can actually give you a suggestion. Place your bet on the turtle, because it could surprise you. Thank you. Distribute them. 
Thank you once again to the Trondheim Academy of Fine Art for helping us bridge uh, technology and art. And uh, also thank you here to Algae, uh, who had like including some nice sustainable dinner suggestions I just saw. Uh, which also reminds me actually that Trondheim is this year's European region of gastronomy. So now that you, now you know that. Next, joining us on stage, we have Optoscale and their CEO, Svein Kolste. Optoscale is a world leader in precision aquaculture, and Svein is an expert in aquaculture, and he's experienced in bridging products to the market. He is involved as well in a number of startups outside of Optoscale, and it is my pleasure to welcome him here to Trondheim Techport. Hello, everyone. Imagine you're out driving your car, maybe after a long day of conference attendance. The speed limit is 70, and you know there's a speed box approaching up ahead in the distance. So what do you do? You check your speedometer, adjust your speed, and you're golden. You made it. My name is uh, Sven. I'm the founder and CEO of Optoscale, and we are bringing the speedometer to fish farming. And because of fish farming, let's put ourselves in the position of a fish farmer. So now imagine not, in, not driving one car, but driving 200 cars at the same time. I don't know about you, but to me that starts sounding like a challenge. But that is not fish farming. Fish farming is driving each and every one of those 200 cars each one obeying a different speed limit. And when you look down to check your speedometer, you realize, oh no, my speedometer, it's broken. The result, not very good, but it means a lot of opportunity. This lack of control and thereby basis for optimization is the reason I started Optoscale seven years ago now. We wanted to create a tool that would help fish farmers accurately know what's going on with their fish. And that's what we've done. But before going any further, let's get a grip on fish farming together. Is it really an industry to uh, speak about at great conferences? I would say yes. I'm from a farm on the west side of, uh, or west coast of Norway. West side is not something we say. Uh, and because I'm from a farm, everything I do must be compared to the size of a cow. That is simply how things are. I'm sure you're familiar. Now, many of you will have driven past these fish farms, but have you ever given thought to how many fish is in each one of them, like in each pen? Try to give that a thought, while knowing that four of these pens will fit within the surface area of a single football pitch. Do you have a number yet? The answer is 200,000. And, of course, when relating this to cows, as we must, the result is 2,000 cows. And I know you're thinking, oh my god, what a beautiful visualization of this. Thank you, Sven. <laughs> you are welcome. But it's incredible, you know, and it's the reason why we are able to export 40 million meals of salmon from Norway every single day, which is just mind-blowing to me, even working in the industry for 10 years now. But they have the problem with not knowing what's exactly going on with their fish, which is crazy given how intense this system of production is. For instance, they don't know the size of their fish, nor the exact welfare condition. 
So that's what we tried to solve. And to solve this, we have created what we call a bioscope. It's an optical sensor system, which is utilizing the latest and greatest of artificial intelligence and all these buzzwords. And what we do is we measure a ton of parameters on the fish. And figuratively, we take the ability of the best fish farmer in the world when it comes to knowing things about the fish, and we multiply that by 10,000 times. Because we can measure hundreds of thousands of fish every single day, like we did with this guy. We can tell the fish farmer, what's the size of the fish? Does it have any welfare issues? Are there any parasites on its body? And so on. And then you can ask, does that matter? Yes, it does, because we know that every day in salmon farming, a thousand truckloads of feed is being used to grow this fish. And we have data suggesting that using our very accurate data about the size of the fish, we can reduce the feed amount to produce the same amount of fish by 10%. And because producing this feed is very energy consumptive, that is the same equivalent as removing one and a half million passenger vehicles from the roads every single year. So that is actually a big contribution to also the climate. So everything is connected to everything. And sadly, it's not enough presenting this at interesting conferences. We also have to work with the industry. And we are fortunate to work with many of the greatest fish farming companies in the world. It all started just a couple of hours drive from here with Salmar who is uh, one of the leading companies in the industry. And today we have customers all along the Norwegian coastline, but we've also expanded to Canada, Scotland, and right now I'm spending a lot of time with the Chilean market, which we will open this year. But really, it's not about companies. It's about what we do for the people in these companies, people that make difficult decisions every single day. For instance, is my fish in need of a treatment so that the welfare situation can be improved, or should I feed it less or more? That's what it's about. People such as Robin. Robin is a production manager at one of our customers, Norway Royal Salmon. And he says the following about working with us. Real-time surveillance of fish welfare has given us vital information. We therefore enter the winter season better prepared and look forward to the future cooperation with Optoscale. And you know, it's seeing quotes like this that makes a founder's heart warm. It's amazing seeing that we are able to put relevant and important data in the hands of people with decision-making power that can actually change how the industry is. And that leads me to my two larger or overarching points in this. How are we going to uh, contribute to the futuristic oceans? Well, number one, we will optimize and make the production of uh, fish and salmon in the beginning sustainable. To us, one of the things that means is producing the most amount of fish for the least amount of feed and with the least amount of environmental uh, consequences. The second is creating a healthy and happy fish, because we know if the fish isn't healthy, the product is going to be bad and the animal welfare will suffer. When we succeed with these two things, what our goal is, is to create fish farming to be a forever industry. And circling back to my past as a farmer, I've never been a farmer, but I come from a farm, there's a saying, you should always leave the farm in a better condition than it, than it was handed to you in. And that implies a basic sustainability in everything you do. I want fish farming to be something we look at as uh, something we'll do forever, with the earth, eternity as our perspective. If that is to be the case, we have to ensure that every single part of the business is sustainable. If not, it won't last forever. We are one part of uh, the big solution to this in fish farming, and it's an incredibly motivating journey because we see our customers are demanding it more from us. They want to go in this direction, and the general public wants it from the fish farmers. So with that, I just want to say thank you very much for listening. And if any of you found this interesting, please come talk to me or check our open positions. Uh, shameless uh, uh, pitch for that. We are looking for more people. We're growing rapidly. So uh, don't hesitate. Leave your current employers. <laughs> OK, thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Swain. Next up, we have the cluster manager of Ocean Autonomy Cluster, Froda Halvorsen. The Ocean Autonomy Cluster represents world-leading research and industry in this region and provides tools for collaborations between its member, all in order to develop world-leading autonomous ocean technology for a better tomorrow. Froda, welcome. Thank you, Karana. Um, Karana and Technoport, thank you for having me here. It's been a great honor. Um, it's actually the, the last place I also presented back in 2020. I started in this position March 1st, 2020. Had 10 days before I was sent home. So March 7th, actually I stand uh, on the stage here. In the last two years we have written a lot of history and right now we are also writing some really dark pages. I hope everything is going to change um, in, the, in the coming weeks. Um, and as a technology optimist, <clears throat> I also think that we should spend our skills and, and brains to, to make technology for a better world. <clears throat> and I also think that Trondheim could excel in at least one of those fields. And that's what I'm going to talk about right now. And I also want to present this with my uh, Trondheim glasses from this Trondheim perspective. So, Ocean Autonomy Cluster uh, started back in uh, March 2020. Our goal is to develop and commercialize world-leading uh, autonomous ocean technology so solutions together with our members. Right now we are about six members. And what's kind of unique with <coughs> our cluster is that we have 50% startups and scale-ups, mostly coming from NTNU and Sintef. But we also have an increasing number of international members. <coughs> and why I'm going to come uh, back to a little bit later. And the Ocean Autonomy is still an early and immature market. It's still based much on, on research and uh, innovation projects. So what is Ocean Autonomy? Uh, for us, it's a, a, a long-term goal, and there's several steps on the way. Uh, I, I'm trying to simplify the, the different steps here. But the first step is, uh, what we are in now, it could be autopilots and other support system. It's to provide the crew with better vessel and situation awareness. The next step is remote controlled, remote operated vessels and other types of robotics with no crew on board, but operated from a shore control center or another vessel. And the last step could be fully autonomous, but then again, what is fully autonomous. Until the robots take over the world, we will still have humans in the loop. <laughs> so, we are not going to take away jobs for, from people. We are actually going to help them um, operate in a better way. We're going to try to remove the dull, dirty and dangerous tasks. I will only focus on, on um, one um, application field here. Um, and it's been um, a topic earlier today, <clears throat> today um, energy. And right now we're also into an uh, energy crisis and also food, try to um, improve food security. So the NVA have this report, Ocean's Future to 2050, where they um, are talking about the nine times growth in spatial requirements for food and energy infrastructure. That means we are going from the size of Switzerland to Japan, or more local uh, scales, for almost from Denmark to mainland Norway, in infrastructure on the, on the ocean. And that can't be done manually. We need to have automated and digitalized um, tasks. That could be both for building this, but also for operating. And who could do this? This robot have been uh, shown earlier today. <clears throat> and I like to think that Loch Ness have the Loch Ness monster, but that's so last year. I think <laughs> I think that, that Trondheim got this uh, autonomous uh, eel, Elum. It's a much better sail pitch than this old monster in Loch Ness. <laughs> and this is taking away dirt and dangerous jobs. This would typically be done by divers or ROVs. <clears throat> And we also have a, um, a less 
famous yet cousin of Illum, um, Ocean Tech. They are working in the, 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 the splash zone. This means that from zero to 15, 20 meters below the, the, the surface, where the most waves and currents are, and where divers can't operate safely and also hard for, for uh, ROVs to operate. So they have these robots that actually climb on the, the structures and do tasks remotely. And on the surface, we have, of course, maritime robotics with their office like 15 minutes, 15, 50 meters away from here, doing tasks on the surface. That could be surveillance and monitoring. And manually, this will be a, a, a robot with two guys sitting and watching. And of course, you have nothing happen for 99% of the time, and then suddenly something happened and you're unfocused. Um, and of, in, in terms of, of cranes, this is a project going on with Sequent Labs and Ökra Maritem. They are reducing the lift time 25% by um, digitalizing and also semi-autonomous uh, cranes. Of course, you're reducing the risk for operators, but also reducing the damage on, on the goods. But not all tasks are dull, dirty, and dangerous. We also want to pr improve the, the services we are given. And of course, I guess all of you have heard about Seabus. And this is a kind of a fascinating story that goes from Milliampire 1. And now, hopefully, we also see Milliampire 2 on the, on the fjord or on the, the canal this summer. And there's this, uh, it's so interesting to see um, the international um, uh, interests of, uh, for, for, uh, for CBUS. And I think we will see uh, some pretty interesting news of, uh, from CBUS in the, the coming weeks and months. <clears throat> um, but I want to uh, do the last. So what have this to do with Trondheim? And brain drain have been a topic earlier this day also. So I have been working with uh, innovation and entrepreneurship in Trondheim for some years, and I think it's, it's time to, to start focusing on, on s s one or some fields. And for me, ocean technology is one of the fields that we really could excel. We got world-leading academia and research. We not got the natural advantages. It's not easy to bring the Trondheim Fjord down to Oslo with you. The Trondheim Fjord stays here. <laughs> And we also have the technology providers and also the technology in the fjord. Sintef and Antonio is doing a fabulous job with Ocean Lab and, and all the things going around, and also this test site for autonomous ships. And also we got years of experience from both aquaculture and oil and gas. So I think this combined will give us a unique competitiveness. So I would really like to see more startups focus on, on the ocean technology, and this could also be a way to make a better future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Froda, and to all the speakers during these sessions of Futuristic Oceans. Uh, it's now time for the last break of the day and final opportunity to visit the Expo and also the Innovation Help Desk area. So I ask you kindly to be back uh, in this room in about 15 minutes at 16.35. <laughs>